What's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? A thermometer and a thermostat. I'll explain in a moment. Uh, this will be the last of the sermons on Philippians. And Paul uses these verses that Glenis read so beautifully for us to summarise everything that he has been writing about. The whole letter is about two things. Firstly, it's a response to a generous collection that was made by the church at Philippi to help support Paul during his imprisonment. This church, although not at all wealthy, was notable for their unique and sacrificial support of Paul and his mission to the Gentile churches and cities from one end of the Middle East to the Mediterranean. Paul refers to them as his partners in ministry and assures them that they share in all his successes as if they themselves had been on the road with him. As he writes in verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Okay? The second thing that this letter is about is how to deal with difficult and dangerous circumstances. Circumstances that arise when one is preaching the gospel in a hostile environment. The remarkable thing is that the more dangerous the situation became, the more Paul seemed to rise to the occasion. He was constantly looking for ways to turn his captivity into opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus. And above all, he demonstrates the hard attitude of total dependence on Jesus that characterised his life right to the very end. So I've been thinking of ways to try and figure out uh, and illustrate the way that Paul was able by the grace of God to minister in the extraordinary way that he did. Under pressure. Always under pressure. It might help us to think of the difference between a thermometer and thermostat and then try and apply that idea or metaphor to ourselves as individuals and see where we sit on the thermometer, thermostat spectrum. Have a think about a thermometer for the moment. A thermometer doesn't change anything around it. It just registers or measures the temperature and tells us how hot or cold it is. It's always going up and down in response to changing temperatures during the day or night. But a thermostat's not the same thing, is it? You can set it to a certain temperature and it regulates the surroundings and changes them when they need to be changed. When someone is a thermometer, they lack the power to change things. Instead, the things change them. They adjust themselves to whatever the prevailing conditions are. If it's hot, they show hot. <clears throat> if it's cooler, they show cooler. Always just reflecting the environment around them without having any influence on those conditions whatsoever. The Apostle Paul was not a thermometer, friends. He was a thermostat. <coughs> Instead of having spiritual ups and downs as the situation changed, he went right on, steadily doing his work and serving Christ. His personal references at the close of the letter indicate that he was not a victim of circumstances. But he was the victor over circumstances. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I can accept all things, I can do all things, and I have all things. Paul did not have to be pampered to be content. He found his contentment in the spiritual resources abundantly provided by Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So firstly, he's content. Verse 11 says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am to be content. 
Content isn't complacent. It's not the same thing. Nor is it a false peace based on ignorance. The complacent believer is unconcerned about others, while the contented Christian wants to share his blessings. Contentment is not escape from the battle, but rather an abiding peace and confidence in the midst of the battle. I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therefore, to be content. Two words that are vitally important, learned and content. The verb learn means learned by experience. Paul's spiritual contentment was not something that he had immediately after he was saved. Did, was, did anyone here receive the supernatural gift of contentment when they got saved? No. He had to go through many difficult experiences of life in order to learn how to be content. The word content actually means contained. It's a description of the man whose resources are within him so that he doesn't have to rely on outside substitutes. The Greek word means self-sufficient and it was a favourite word used by the Stoic philosophers which was the, the prevailing philosophy of the day in the culture around Paul. But the Christian is not sufficient in himself, is he? He is sufficient in Christ. Because Christ lives within us, we are adequate for the demands of life. So this is a situation where Paul took a word and he gave it a whole new meaning as a believer. He does that all the way through his letters. The man was a genius. Next, I can do all things, Philippians 4.13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned, both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And while Paul was grateful for the, the gift that the Philippians gave him, he did not want them to think that he was one who went about with his hand out. Paul was thankful for the gift. But he was supremely thankful that the Lord had taught him to be content in every circumstance. What was the key to Paul's contentment? His answer, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I'm just going to spend a couple of moments on that verse. All right? I did an assignment at Bible College on this verse. And I'm going to show you a slideshow, some of the slides that I used in that presentation. Because this is probably the most abused and misrepresented scripture in the whole Bible. All over the world, people have just taken it out of context and used it to mean that Jesus will equip them to do crazy things Things that were never intended by Paul. So I'm going to show you a few slides, okay? And then we'll get back to the message about what Paul is preaching about. Okay, Philippians 4.13. Is it really the Superman scripture? Then we see the big shield. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Looks like that, doesn't it? <laughs> Superman scripture. Don't try this at home. See, this is the way, you, if you go to the internet and you have a look at all the pictures with this scripture, you see this sort of nonsense. A kid standing on a cliff with a Superman cape. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Really? Don't do that at home. Then we come to body art. 
I've kept it clean. People have this scripture in places that I cannot show on that screen. All right? So we've got arms and necks and probably backs or bellies. Who knows? But trust me, there's not too many places on the human body that people haven't tattooed that scripture. Is that an abuse of scripture or what? Oh, I'd say so. A total abuse of scripture. And here we have the sort of stuff we see. You've got Sports Illustrated there. See Tim Tebow? He's got his little back patches under his eye. You know what it's got printed on him? Philippians 4.13. Right? You see it again, that same bloke down below, you see his writing there. You can see the Nike ad. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's advertising sporting goods for athletes. You've got bracelets. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Sporting stuff. Necklaces. There's a, there's a baseball there. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's crazy, isn't it? People have just taken this verse and done ridiculous things with it. Paul does not mean to imply that Christ is like some magical genie in a lamp who renders us able to do anything we want. But that's not what this scripture is about, is it? That's right. I like genie. This is one of my favourite New Testament scholars. In fact, he's a, a Bible scholar. Probably the best in America for, for me because I just like him. Uh, ben Witherington III. As I like to say to my students, a text without a context is a pretext for whatever you want it to say. In other words, if you just say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, without putting the bit in front of it and the bit that follows it, you can get that to mean anything you want. And that's what these people have done. They've taken that scripture, just one sentence, and they've used it to mean things that were just never intended by Paul at all. Okay? And now that I've got rid of that nonsense, all right, it's just to show you how crazy this world is with scriptures. When he wrote what we call Philippians 4.13, for him it wasn't Philippians 4.13, was it? It was just a, a line of a line in a letter. It was not something that slipped from Paul's pen in an unguarded moment in which he was caught up with emotion. He genuinely experienced the strength of Christ. When he pleaded with the Lord to remove his physical condition from him, the Lord responded, how? My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. He would later write when he was completely forsaken by others, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Although God's people are called to be diligent in ministering to their brothers and sisters in Christ, they sometimes fail. When others fail us, we should be glad that the Lord never fails. And when we do not receive ministry from others, we should content ourselves with God and his sufficiency. I mean, that lovely song that we heard this morning from uh, City of Light, that's uh, Anglican Church, St Philip's in Carlingford, Sydney. Yeah, they've Castle got it. Hill. Castle Hill, is that? Mm. Okay. St, at, at Castle Hill. They're, um, they've got a fantastic music ministry. We sing several of those songs here. The best loved of all the Psalms begins, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. With the Lord as his shepherd, David knew that he would not lack anything he truly needed. The prophet Habakkuk discovered the same truth. He put it like this. Probably not many of you could find Habakkuk. I'll put it up. You probably all know the, the scripture. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labour of the olive may fail, 
and the, the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high heels. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? While we certainly do not consider ourselves to attain the spiritual letter of Paul or David or Habakkuk, the marvellous truth is that we too can draw strength from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now let's talk about supply. This is another, verse 19, my God shall supply all your needs. That's another verse that gets taken out of context and misused. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from verse 17 through to 19 and you can see how it fits in and what he's actually talking about. He says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full of having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Why will God supply all their needs? Because they supplied his Okay? They supplied Paul's needs. And Paul blesses them, saying, The Lord will supply your needs. It's a thank you, a blessing for their generous giving. It's often been misunderstood, that scripture. It doesn't tell us that God's people will never experience or feel a need. It rather tells us that God will supply the needs of his people. He sometimes does this by meeting the need. That's always good. And sometimes by giving his people the strength to face the need. That's sometimes not quite as good, is it? Mm. It's tough. The Apostle has already testified to that. Israel's great King David says to the Lord, For by you I can run through a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. That's Psalm 18. We always prefer to leap over a wall of need, don't we? Leaving it behind. But we should not despise the other possibility, that is... God enabling us to run against or go through a troop. Sometimes God takes us right through the need, giving us strength as we go. David himself experienced this on several occasions, most notably when he went out to meet the giant Goliath. God could have removed Goliath, couldn't he? I mean, he could have vaporised him as David walked towards him. Instead, God gave David the strength to face him and defeat him. Needs that simply get vaporised may seem more glamorous. But strength to face and meet needs is just as much from God, isn't it? That's where we learn. Now to close this down, I'm not going to close the, the sermon with those final verses. The, you remember we, when the letter starts off with an address block? Well it finishes with a, a greeting and grace. Right? That, so that, that's just the way it is. It's just how you sign off. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to, for, for today, we'll finish with verse 20.
Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. We should not dismiss those words as mere formality. Yes, Paul is bringing his letter to a close, but he means every single word of that verse. It is his fervent desire to see God receive glory and honour, both in this life and in the life to come. God is worthy of honour because he's God. He is the sovereign creator and ruler of all things. He is clothed with majesty and splendour beyond our ability to understand. He is eternal, he is holy, he is faithful, he is just and he is true. He is unlimited in wisdom and power. He is immeasurably kind and gracious. God is also worthy of honour because he is Father. He is the Father of all those whom by grace he has adopted into his family. As their Father, he loves them with an undying love and tenderly supplies their needs and protects them from any real harm. Such a God deserves our praise and our worship, both in this life and the world to come. Eternity itself will not be sufficient to praise him adequately as Paul pondered the greatness and the glory of God and the worship of the saints in eternity. He could not help but say, Amen. That is, let it be. May we add our own Amen to his. Amen. Amen. Amen.